this week on the show. On board the world's biggest civilian hospital ship. Where would you like to go? Do you have any ideas? Aruba. Oh, nice. Aruba, I like that. Greening up your trip while staying in the black. Affordable travel is definitely green travel. And building a record breaker in the Himalayas. When COVID swept the world back in 2020, shutting borders and grounding flights, holiday makers weren't the only travellers to be stuck at home. Many overseas volunteering projects were also locked down. In fact, voluntourism provider Projects Abroad says numbers won't be back to normal until 2024. But Moored in the harbour of Senegal's capital, Dakar, could be just the thing to kickstart the sector once more. So this is a Global Mercy. Oh, mind the step. It's only a couple of months old. As you can see, it's still sparkling and new. And it's manned completely by volunteers who give up their home comforts to come here. The wards are empty right now, but in a few months' time, they'll start filling up with Senegalese patients coming on board for routine operations. The aim is to transform 150,000 lives around the world through surgery and train thousands of new medics. Well, I feel like I'm in a, in a hospital, but... OK, I think we have to go this way. But it's strange because when you're walking on the floor, of course, we're not on land and you get the odd movement every so often. Okay, we're going to be a little bit quiet. They're currently doing a neonatal resuscitation workshop. The ship's run by a Christian charity and is part of a long tradition of volunteering by religious groups. In the Islamic world, for example, you've got the Mission Possible scheme run by Islamic Help, which delivers aid to people who need it. And there are countless projects looking for volunteers to teach English to Buddhist monks in Nepal, or the informal drop-ins at the communal kitchen in Sikh temples across India. You don't have to be Christian to work on the Global Mercy, though. You don't even need medical training, as support staff are also needed to help run the ship. Yeah, our volunteer crew are amazing. Uh, they give up being close to family, being close to friends. Many of them are walking away from salaried jobs and positions and work in order to volunteer here. It's just incredible that they come. <laughs> Really what they're walking, from, uh, walking away from is safety and security. A little bit into the unknown, taking a risk. And how does it work? So let's say I'm, I decide I'm, I'm going to come and, and volunteer. I mean, do I have to pay? Yeah, so we have a crew fee system where crew are not just volunteering, but they're covering their room and board in that. But that's covering their food and, the, and their stay here. Um, and, uh, and so normally someone has some kind of volunteer support for that as well. In recent years, some Western aid projects have been criticised with complaints they've arrived in Africa like so-called white saviours, demeaning and patronising the people they're trying to help. What's your kind of answer to that? And so when Mercy Ships comes into a country, we're not just showing up with the ship on its doorstep and doing our thing. That is not how we operate. We're actually working with the nation, working with the Ministry of Health, working with local partners, community leaders, years before the ship even arrives. And the question we're asking them is, what do you need? How can we serve you? This is your nation, these are your people, it's your vision. How can we help you get there? So this is the residential floor. Already it looks completely different. Like in a sort of wooden look. And 
I was so keen to see what it looks like inside a family's apartment. Oh, cute. OK, this is one of the children's bed, I imagine. So they have three kids. I'm guessing one sleeps in there, two in here, and they actually have a fourth one on the way. But I can see they've made a very good usage of the space. The cabin belongs to the Van der Spike family from the Netherlands. They've been volunteering on Mercy ships for more than a decade. Justin and Marianne even met on one and married shortly afterwards. Well, we met on board the Africa Mercy 12 years ago. It was in Lomé in Togo. And from Lomé, we traveled to Ghana, to Accra, the Cape Coast. It was really impressive. Uh, and we traveled to Cotonou in, Lo in uh, Benin. Yeah, it was also really cool. Are we ready? Come on. Was the ability to be able to travel around part of the decision making when you decided to join? It wasn't the, the reason, but it's a really a fun part of it. And it's, in that way, it's really important to uh, be able to see the world, to show the kids the world um, and see different cultures. And uh, I mean, they're in English school, they're, they learn a different language. I mean, all these kind of things are benefit and, and uh, something positive, I guess. Ready, one, two, three, put it out. So what's your favourite part about living on the ship? Uh, I like it that we live close to our friends. What do you feel that travel brings to the kids? I can show my kids that it is not normal to have all these uh, hospitals around you and it's not normal to, to be rich or to, to buy anything you like. They have really been exposed when we went to Sali here in uh, uh, Senegal. Uh, in the evening when we took a taxi back that, that some kids were begging for food. And that's, that's really impressive for the kids. And um, um, yeah, then, then you have the, yeah, and then you have the ability to explain them that, you know, <laughs> we don't throw food away. We try not, right? If you, you finish your plate and, and, and all that, that kind of things make more sense. Where would you like to go? Do you have any ideas? Aruba. Oh, nice. Aruba, I like that. Natural climate. Justin has to get back for his dinner shift. He's got meat to chop. He's one of the many on board who don't have any medical training. Oh, it's tempting. Do you know, I'm going to have a little bit of everything. That's fine. Yeah. People come here to surf for months and years, and sometimes only a couple of weeks in any number of roles. Yeah. And then some green beans, yes, please. Emmanuel is a biomedical engineer from Benin and a long-termer on Mercy ships. So would you say this is a good way of seeing the world? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You, you get to share with local communities, you know, and you get to learn something from them. You know, sometimes also there is resilience, if I can call it, like, you know, they're, they go through so much, but they don't give up. So what's your favourite part about being on the road, or maybe I should say on, on the sea? You know, to be able to be part of this community, the friendships, you know, like, you get to meet people from all over the world, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a blessing. Emmanuel is here for the work, less so the travel. His favourite memories all involve the people he's helped, rather than the places he's been, and his outlook is not untypical. So volunteerism is nothing new, but what's happening here feels very different. Some of the volunteers that I met have been here for over a decade, and that takes some commitment. Well, Senegal isn't the only place where you can use your skills to take a volunteering break. And if you're tempted, here's our guide to the do's and don'ts of volunteering responsibly. Will your work create lasting value? Choose a company that has proper monitoring in place. Providers like Projects Abroad work to UN sustainability goals and publish annual impact reports. Find out which companies are more interested in making the project fun for the volunteer rather than valuable for the recipient. 
some companies will sign you up and then hand you over to a third party with no accountability or even worse drop you into an area with no proper planning or anyone local to complain to the international volunteer program association says that's the number one reason things fall apart reputable outfits will offer you in-country support and get all the information well in advance. The work can be in remote areas requiring extra planning. Where will you stay? How will you be trained for the work? What happens if you get sick or have an accident? Check your provider will throw in medical and liability insurance. Okay, stay with us because in a moment, making eco affordable, why greening your travel doesn't have to cost the earth. When you think about how to save money on the road, you're tending to do a lot of the things everyday people do in that destination. And that inherently means avoiding huge resorts that are energy intensive, huge amounts of imported food. And we visit the bridge that's making records on the roof of the world. See you after the break. Hello and welcome to Senegal, a truly stunning country that's on the west coast of Africa and it's been my home for the past three years. This week we're in the Senegalese capital, Dakar. A five minute boat ride away from the dust and bustle, this is Ngor Island, a little slice of surface paradise. Whilst we're here, there's one thing I want to show you. Est-ce que ça veut dire que c'est Pour avoir une assiette de Tchiboujen Yeah, s'il vous plaît. So, Tchiboujen is a national dish in Senegal. Cheb means rice, bou, with, and djen, fish. And if you're going to come, this is one dish that you have to try. Pourquoi est-ce que le Tchiboujen du Sénégal est si spécial Parce qu'on ne prépare pas ça avec amour. Ah, Au Sénégal, tout le monde aime le Tchiboujen. Ici, c'est la teranga. Et les gens, quand ils mangent du Tchiboujen, normalement, c'est ensemble. Hein. Ouais. Parle-moi un peu de ça. Oui, ensemble. Et on mange ça en famille. Et le papa, la maman, la maman, tout le monde à table. Yeah. Dans le même bol. Hein? Oui, dans le même bol. Yeah, merci. Now, in Ghana and Nigeria, this same dish is called jollof. And foodies from those two countries have been tussling over ownership for years. But while they've been bickering, the Senegalese may have just snatched it from under their noses. In December, the UN's heritage body UNESCO granted so-called Senegalese jollof intangible cultural heritage status. It's definitely not just about the food, it's also where you eat the food. This view, priceless. My name is Matthew Katniss and I run the website nomadicmap.com and I've been helping people travel on a budget since 2008. Time to start our rail trip across Europe for destination, two weeks, let's do this. Pre-COVID, you were in this uh, phase that was sort of the golden age of cheap travel. You had a lot of web services and cheap flight websites, companies like Airbnb that really allowed people to break out of that old paradigm of resorts, hotels, cruises. And you had the rise of budget airlines uh, that also helped lower costs. Post COVID, costs are definitely gone up. You had a lot of businesses shut down. You've had airlines reduce their staffing as well as their schedules and so now with everybody just really back out into the world trying to make up for lost time you have less capacity and a higher demand and you know in, especially when you factor in all the supply chain issues and just rising costs of food and energy you're just really seeing a lot higher costs right now and uh, i think that's going to stay for a long time Affordable travel is definitely green travel because when you think about how to save money on the road, you're tending to do a lot of the things 
everyday people do in that destination. And that inherently means avoiding huge resorts that are energy intensive, huge amounts of imported food, private cars and transportation, big things. You know, you're using the tools and resources that a local uses, and that is often less energy intensive. Three tips to travel sustainably and affordably. First and foremost, public transportation. Avoid flying as much as you can. Trains and buses do take longer, uh, but they're just gonna be much better for the environment. Second, get out of major tourist areas. I can't emphasize this enough. So going to smaller destinations that don't see a huge impact on their local infrastructure. An example that comes to mind is Tulum, Mexico. Big beach town, everybody goes there, but they just don't have the infrastructure to meet the demand. So maybe going to a smaller town further away, um, it's more inland that has that kind of infrastructure. And not only does that spread out the positive impact of tourism, you know, the financial positive impact, but it reduces the stress on, again, local infrastructure. Getting out of a major tourist area is also much more affordable because you know, these smaller towns, these more out of the way destinations, since they don't see as many tourists, prices aren't as high. Tip number three, carrying a water bottle. I mean, it's a very simple thing, but uh, you're really reducing the amount of plastic you use. I use a filtered water bottle to ensure that even if I'm in countries where uh, the tap water isn't safe, I'm not forced to buy water bottles. Green travel is not just about lowering your energy uses, it's also about spreading your tourism dollars around. Well, to finish off this week, we're off to India, which is a country well known for its massive railway network. It's one of the biggest in the world, but it will soon also be joining the record books as the proud home of the highest railway bridge. Kind of appropriately, it's been built in the Himalayas and we've been to take a look. very difficult to construct bridges in the Himalayan region because of adverse weather conditions. In winter, there will be extreme low temperatures and also it is very difficult to bring in the manpower resources here to execute the project. The most suitable location was this location. Considering the geography of the nature of the hills, nowhere nearby was not possible. The year 2006 when I came at this site, uh, there was not even a single transportation to reach at this site, from Riyasi to here. There was no school at this site, uh, no bus stands, not even autos was running at that time. Not even the ponies and uh, horses were available at that time. Uh, with the passage of time, first we construct the road. That the road is of uh, near about 15 kilometers. With the help of that road, the transportation has started. The cable crane installed for the erection of arch in this project is one of the highest in the world. The span of the cable crane is 915 meters. It is almost one kilometer. And the height of the pylon, you can see, it is 127 meters height. And the other side, it is 110 meters height. The bridge is designed for redundancy. If any pillar or any steel pier or steel trussle gets damaged due to any other reasons, still the train will, will be able to move. For this project, we have engaged almost 60 to 70 percent of the local workforce. We created a training, welding centers, to train the local people to carry out the welding works. Not only this, with this training, they were able to get employments in other places also. Some of the welders went abroad also. 
see recently we did it actually the arch erection. This arch is actually a quadratic arch, parabolic arch. So both the foundation has a different level. And uh, now our job, uh, main job is to have a uh, deck launching on either end. Almost uh, 136 meter has been completed. Uh, so we are in the process of uh, completion of the projects. Look, Kashmir Valley is now the transport of our transport is by road. So it has been a lot of time. We have to send Kashmir to the same place. So it has been a lot of time for 48 hours or 2 days. When we have to connect with our train, it will be a lot of time for 20 to 22 hours. The train will come to the same place. Before the train, it was very bad. Actually, on the highway, if there is a little jamming, it would take कम से कम कम से कम तीन चार घंटे लगते थे आपको मिनिमम श्रीनगर आने के लिए बनिहाल से एक्चुअली बनिहाल से ही अब ले लें तो पंद्रह किलोमीटर का चढ़ाई है चढ़ाई पे ये होता था बर्फ होती थी कम से कम कोई चार चार फुट तो ऊपर होती है टॉप कोरा लग जाता था फ्रॉस्ट होता था तो वो पिघलने में पहले आधा दिन लग जाता था तो फिर जब गाड़ियाँ निकलती थी कोई ख़राब हुई कुछ हो गया तो पूरा कोई चार चार पाँच पाँच घंटे लग जाते थे सबसे बड़ी बात सर्दियों में रास्ता बंद हो जाता था, या टिकट्स भी वो आसमान को छूने लगती थी रेट्स उनके, तो उसकी वजह से वो लोगों की प्रॉब्लम भी सॉल्व हो जाएगी। मेरे पापा एल हैं, उनको ही आँखों की प्रॉब्लम है, अस्थमा है, तो दवाइयाँ लेने लाने बनहाल में सारी दवाइयाँ नहीं होती, हफ्ते आज तो किराया भी कम है और आराम से भी पहुंचते हैं ऑफिस। पहले तो कम से कम तीन घंटे लगते हैं अनंतनाग से श्रीनगर तक। आज ये डेढ़ घंटा बस ऑफिस में भी एक रेस्पेक्ट होता है जब हम टाइम पर पहुंचते हैं। पहले तो हम टाइम पर नहीं पहुंचते हैं। बहुत खुश हैं हम बहुत खुश हैं क्योंकि हम एन्जॉय भी करते हैं और मजा भी आता है। Well, that's it from us for now. Join us again next week when... Carmen's in Venice to meet the scuba diving gondoliers with a job on their hands. That's one hardcore scuba diving suit. There's not one bit of skin showing. Now, I've dived before. I'm not sure I'd want to go into the canals of Venice, as lovely as they are. Check us out on social media for more amazing travel content from the BBC. And it's goodbye for now from me in Senegal and see you soon.